Welcome to our keynote panel, Unpacking Iceberg Catalogs. It is my pleasure to introduce the panel moderator, Daniel Weeks, co-creator of Apache Iceberg. Hi, everyone. My name is Dan Weeks, and I'm co-creator of Apache Iceberg, co-founder and CTO here at Tabular. And I'm really excited to welcome everybody to our panel tonight, which is Unpacking Iceberg Catalogs. With me, I've got a number of great panelists here. We're going to go through each one of them and allow them to introduce themselves. And then we're going to dive into the panel questions. So first off, I'm going to hand it over to Jack Yi. Uh, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Jack. I am a senior engineer at AWS. Uh, my team manages the open source based compute engines, including EMR, Athena, and Google ETL. And my team specifically works for storage layer solutions, including Iceberg, Google Delta, and Hive. Uh, I'm also a PNC member at uh, the Iceberg Project. Thanks, Jack. Edward, you're next. Hey, guys. My name is Edward. I work with Dana Tabular, and I get to build really cool things, and I get to work on Iceberg, and it's been you know, a lot of fun. Thanks, Edward. I'll hand it off to Anjali next. Hi, I'm Anjali Norwood. I lead the Big Data Analytics Platform team at Netflix. My team owns analytics side processing, iceberg table format development, um, storage of data, engines like Spark, Trino, and orchestration technologies. A fun tidbit about me, Dan was my first manager at Netflix, and I did a little bit of iceberg development and Trino development. Thanks, Anjali. And lastly, Russell. Hi, everyone. I'm Russell Spitzer. I'm uh, an engineering manager at Apple and also an iceberg PMC. Uh, and we uh, work on open source iceberg and lake house solutions at Apple. That's uh, what we do. Thanks, everyone, for joining. So uh, to kick things off, I'm going to give just a quick little background on kind of my thoughts about what a catalog is in terms of iceberg and what its main function is. And then we'll dive into some questions around catalogs and the history amongst all of these people on the panel. So uh, I often like to talk about catalogs in terms of like the primary functions that a catalog actually provides uh, for Iceberg. And there are two main ones. Uh, the first one is how do you like address data? How does somebody identify it? And we usually think of that in terms of like uh, SQL, like name references for tables. And so the catalog provides the functionality of taking that logical ta table name reference and pointing to the current state of a table. So that's the main function. Uh, the second function is to provide a way to atomically update that state of the table. So in Iceberg, uh, when you transition from one version of a table to the next, you have to do that as part of an atomic operation. And so you're largely changing that reference. And those are the two key functions. There's a lot of other things that catalogs do, like listing tables and providing information about tables. But those are kind of the two primary ones from Iceberg's perspective. So with that said, we're going to go through and talk a little bit about initially kind of the journey people have gone through in terms of incorporating Iceberg catalogs, where they are today, and what the future may look like. So I guess starting with Jack, uh, maybe give us a little bit of history about like catalogs, how you and Athena and EMR have thought about these and where they, they started and where you're going today. Uh, yeah, sure. I think our journey started probably back in, I don't know, 2020, a long time back. And uh, we were starting a new team, which is a storage team. And we are looking into different storage solutions, uh, Hoodie, Delta, Iceberg, being the three big ones. And uh, on the Iceberg front, we immediately realized that Unlike the other two solutions, which are kind of more storage based, um, catalog is an essential part of the whole story in Iceberg. And uh, of course, being uh, we immediately started to build integrations with the de facto catalog in AWS, which is the Glue catalog. And it has been still the de facto catalog that we uh, promote for most of the features we have today for Iceberg integrations. And uh, then I think we went through this phase of uh, celebrating this plug or feature of Iceberg catalogs with different vendors. Uh, there are more and more vendors adding their integrations, like I remember Alibaba, uh, Dell EMC, Snowflake, all these ones we help review and add those catalogs into the integration. There was even one I think we added for Salesforce because they say that uh, we only we can't depend on Dynamo. So 
So, so we offered actually a Dynamo DB based kind of implementation for them. And, uh, and people can basically pick and choose which, whichever solution that is that best fit their need. Uh, and then it went into like a consolidation phase. I think that um, people start to realize there are, actually there are too many catalogs right now. And, uh, and uh, there are different problems. I guess we can talk afterwards a, bit, a little bit. So, so right now, most of the customers we have are consolidated into two different directions. Either you just want things work out of the box, then you use glue and uh, everything will work. Or you want a lot of flexibility and customizations, then many people are going with the REST approach as a standardization. So I think that is what we are today. And as a maintainer of different engines, we essentially build integrations, mainly focusing on these two solutions. Thanks, Jack. Edward, do you want to take it next? Sure. I mean, um, you know, when Tabular was born, Tabular was built uh, using the REST catalog um, simply because it provides a lot of benefits. There, there are simply a bunch of certain, you know, certain limitations with existing catalogs. To me personally, you know, my catalog journey, you know, outside of Tabular is I previously I was working on at Dremio building out the uh, was involved in building out the Nessie catalog and over to about two years ago, I moved to Tabular. So that this is when I got involved in, in the REST catalog. And, you know, going forward, we have a lot of um, customers running, running the REST catalog. It provides a lot of benefits that we, I'm sure we, we will go into a little bit more detail later today. But it, you know, it, and it, the REST catalog showed um, fairly easy ways to, to implement to, to get new clients to talk, uh, the rest API, you know, like there, there's been new developments around Pi iceberg, um, the rust client and the go client, and they're all, they're all speaking the rest catalog. So there, there are a lot of benefits and, you know, we as the iceberg community believe that the future is going towards more and more towards the rest catalog simply because, you know, there are certain benefits, like I said, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about those later. Thanks, and Anjali. I know that Netflix has a long history with catalogs. Uh, do you want to take us through a little bit of that? Indeed. Uh, I'm happy to say that our warehouse is about 99.9x percent iceberg now, but it was not always the case, obviously. Uh, there was a lot of Hive, Druid, Snowflake, Redshift, even Cassandra, and all of this data, uh, we had our own implementation called Metacat. That is where it was cataloged. This is a Hive Meta store, was backed by MySQL. And then MetaKit also served another purpose, that of storing other data, which is not strictly uh, table metadata. Examples like business unit that owns the table, or what is the, is it does it have PII information? So a lot of other information was also in there. Um, when we started moving to Iceberg, and that became our paved path format, we started seeing issues with uh, Hive Meta Store not scaling. Horizontal scaling was not happening. Also, as we mapped Iceberg to Iceberg metadata to store in this uh, Meta Store, the schema didn't quite match. Because for Iceberg, all you need to store is a location, and you need to do like a check input operation. And the Hive Meta Store was optimized for all the schema bunch of tables, joins to return that metadata. So that design was not quite working. So anyway, these were some of the issues, but for scaling issues, we swapped out the, the backing implementation. We added Polaris, we built Polaris. This is our homebrew uh, new catalog that's backed by CockroachDB and it's super optimized for Iceberg. It does this check input operation really well. And we are about 70% on Polaris. Now, at the same time, Iceberg REST catalog was coming up, and we were interested in using Python Iceberg library because we have internal uh, application called Craggle, which is our Python interface, programmatic interface to all of our engines. So we uh, started building our IRC implementation, and uh, that is what our Python Iceberg, it integrates with Python Iceberg and Craggle. So that's where we are right now. but. I think we have ways to go. This story is not yet complete. Okay, Russell. 
Yeah, I mean, we, we've had a really long history with the Iceberg Project and with catalogs as well. I mean, so we started out um, basically just applying Iceberg as a library and allowing people to bring their own catalogs in. So we have, uh, I work at a very large company, so a lot of different people doing all kinds of different things and sometimes hard to get everyone unified. So we were supporting all sorts of different clients and different versions on different meta stores. And I think that's when it first really hit me that the current setup oh, back then of having all of the locking logic in the client was going to really cause me trouble for the rest of my life if we didn't change it. Um, I think a lot of you will remember way back then, you know, if there was ever a commit bug, uh, an issue in the actual commit protocol of your iceberg library, you had to make sure all of your clients upgraded. There wasn't a one place where you could make the change and suddenly rescue yourself from serialization issues. You had to make sure hunting down every single one of your users that no one was using that old version. And if anyone ever happened to, if you had some job that was put on a timer and would trigger in like 300 days, it was just like a ticking time bomb, that the moment it ran, it would go back, use that old broken commit logic and do something terrible. So those days I was getting getting very nervous and we of course had our own solutions trying to get everyone to only use versions that we supplied, only supporting one at a time, things like that. Then we started consolidating um, in catalogs. We have sister teams that work on uh, catalogs similar that Netflix has, you know, uh, unified catalogs that kind of gather metadata for lots of different use cases. Again, we aren't able to get everyone into that. Uh, but that got us away from a lot of those uh, early issues because we could make sure people were on the right clients. We could do other kinds of things, um, but we're really excited also about REST catalog. So there's various projects uh, going on or people working on, on REST compatible uh, uh, client uh, catalogs um, because we also really want Pi Iceberg to be easily available for everyone. Uh, it turns out you know, I, I feel like this has happened to me multiple times. I got really into Spark and I'm like, everyone would love Scala. So like everyone should just write Scala to work with this. And it turns out no one likes to write Scala except for me. And then similarly, you know, we got to, to this. And I'm like, oh, this is great. We can all just do SQL. At least that's enough. And then you know, it turns out all the ML folks really want Python and they don't really care too much about the SQL. So, you know, I'm, I'm always behind the trends, um, but I'm hoping with, with REST Catalog, we can really provide something that works for, for lots of people. And again, we won't have those same issues where if we have serious bugs or serious things we need to fix. We can do it in a centralized place and clean up everybody at the same time and not be beholden to, uh, to those pesky users doing whatever they like. <laughs> That's great. It's actually hard to talk about catalogs without talking about pain points, which is actually the next uh, question, which is kind of, you know, okay, well, given the current state of things, what catalogs do you support both internally or like as a vendor or something like that? You know, what's going well? What kind of challenges are, are you facing? Uh, Jack, back to you. Uh, I guess what was going well, as I said in the last question, at least for now, we are mostly considering customers to either Glue or REST, uh, which are two kind of server-based solutions. So if you, for the customers who are relatively small and uh, they just want a solution out of the box and uh, always have the latest AWS integrations, then Glue is the kind of de facto choice. And for large enterprises, we, we see Netflix, Apple, and quite a few other ones that have their own data infrastructure, infrastructure team, have different legal requirements, complex permission models internally, um, they can they have the ability to pull up a REST service, and then we can build good integration with them in engines through that. So, so you both have the flexibility as a data infra team, and also you get good integrations with vendors. So you kind of get the best of the both worlds. So at least we are already in that pretty nice stage. Um, not everyone is in that state, but people are moving towards those uh, on their own pace. Um, and for the issues, uh, which is kind of related to what I was talking about, about the mini catalogs situation, um, we, um, and also I think Russell touched a little bit about that, is a, it is related to, we have to find libraries to all the different things. This, this was a lesson learned um, already we had in EMR because we are already in EMR 7, but we still have to maintain EMR 2. For some customers and people just, there are people who are never upgrade things. And for Glue, we 
got things lucky that uh, we were a relatively early adopter. So, and we got most of our features in before people started to seriously productionize Iceberg. So, so we don't really need to upgrade that as often. But for other catalog users like the DLDB catalog or uh, like the Dell EMC catalogs, those kind of things, then people start to get into a really a painful state that they have to operate on their own. And uh, uh, we, we, we can coordinate with them, but they, they have to spend lots of resources in doing those kind of things. And also from an engine integration perspective, although these are all iceberg, um, we still spend a lot of effort in optimizing the catalog integrations because uh, although, although catalog is mainly only doing metadata calls, uh, it is still spending time and time is very important in optimizing latency. Uh, we spend lots of effort in minimizing the latency, doing caching, all those kind of stuff um, in a very specific set of catalogs. And uh, when, we, uh, when we have to prioritize, there will, will be some customers that are left out. And that is why um, people are starting to try to know that, okay, now we know that you will either choose Glue or you can use REST, then they have a much better way to um, build their own infrastructure to, to have the best engine integrations out of the box. Thanks, Jack. Edward? So a little bit related to the dependency hell. So I think what works quite well for us, you know, given that we're running a REST catalog is that, you know, we essentially don't have that, that issue, luckily. Um, it is very easy to get started, right? If you use, for example, Spark, all you do is like provide the the iceberg version you want to use, and some additional configuration around, you know, which which server you're connecting, what is your warehouse name, and that stuff. But it's like a very very minimal set of parameters that you need, and that you know, that makes a lot of things very easy for users to get started. I think the other things that are working quite well for us, um, you know, in general, the the performance and scalability of, of running the REST catalog. And also, you know, given that the way, um, given the way that the, the REST protocol does certain things, right? It, it has like a very fine grained approach to do um, to the updates. That means when you have potential conflicts, you, you can do server side retries, which is really possible in other catalogs. And that makes a bunch of things just, you know, less of a headache. Also, you know, you, you can just do, and, and we do this already, like uh, certain things like, you know, la lazy snapshot loading. Like if you have a, many, many, many snapshots and you load the table, right? And you have like, I don't know, 100,000 snapshots. You don't necessarily want to load all of them. You only load them when you really need them, right? And that, that you know, s capabilities like this is what the REST catalog enables. And, you know, for, our largest customers, we've seen like great improvements in, in that area. And, you know, I'm also excited about, you know, what, what, what the future, uh, future uh, features are coming to the REST catalog, which will just, uh, you know, like server side scan planning, for example, which will, you know, make certain things just, just easier. Um, talking about challenges. I mean, I think the, the one challenge that I see, and it's it's less about running um, and like maintaining a REST catalog. It's more about like the community adopting the REST catalog. Like even today, it's it's fairly easy to get started, but I think users all are still struggling a little bit with, oh, okay, so I'm starting the REST catalog, you know, I'm, I'm using the REST catalog client, but I still need the REST server. And I mean, as the, the ICO community provides something there. And you can technically run it in production, and, and you know, um, but I think people, the community is a little bit struggling with um, understanding the full the full potential there. And I think we just need to do a little bit of better job of like um, showing you know the, the the real benefits of stuff, right? Yep, that's great. I, I think the you know the adoption curve we're just at the very beginning of this, and so hopefully things will get easier. Anjali. Yeah, um, Polaris, which is sort of MetaCat version two for Iceberg, has been working out pretty okay. But we are carrying some 
baggage, some legacy things like iceberg data types get mapped into hive data types, which in turn get, ma get mapped into big data types. So we want to get away from all this business and standardize on iceberg data types. But this is probably more of an artifact of our architecture than anything else. But a couple pain points, um, and Edward referred to one of them, is frequently updated tables. The metadata JSON gets huge, so load table operation gets super slow. And we put in optimizations here and there, but they are not universal. And they're not applicable everywhere. So that's a bigger problem for us. Um, another one is migrating iceberg clients. Those become projects in themselves because these are thick clients and we have multiple engines in multiple places and users using iceberg library as well directly. So just bringing about uh, that upgrade feels like a huge chore. So iceberg risk catalog solves a lot of these problems. So we are super excited about uh, taking our catalog story forward with the rest catalog. OK, Russell? Yeah, I think I think like I mentioned before, um, we're a big organization. So we end up supporting a lot of things. Um, I'd say chiefly we have Hive compliant meta stores that we're dealing with. Um, and our, our biggest bottlenecks are, are usually things involving original Hive locking. So, uh, I'm sure everyone here who's used the Hive Metastore and tried to do a lot of concurrent operations with their locking mechanism will, will quickly realize that, um, to their credit, their locking mechanism is serializable, but that also means that it is really, really painful um, if all you want is like a semaphore. Um, so that's basically all iceberg needs. But instead, it ends up, uh, I believe it scales n squared with the, the number of locks you have, the amount of time it takes to check the status of a lock, which ends up um, being really, really bad uh, if you have lots of concurrent people attempting to modify a table. So um, we've been really happy to move uh, away from that in some places. Uh, I'm really excited about the REST catalog uh, as a way to, to kind of avoid that entirely, because I, I that, that locking mechanism has, has been a pain for me for a while. And, and I think one of the things in the catalog story that I, I want to say we explicit, explicitly don't support, and I'm I'm hoping we can all reach some community agreement on this uh, later, is, is the Hadoop uh, catalog implementation, um, which uh, while it's really useful for testing environments and things like that, it's it's often one of the the earliest things we'll have a user try out and then attempt to put into production and then and hit some unknown barriers there or some unknown things or, uh, you know, at, at a certain point, I, I think we, we, we're, we like to put a lot on the file system and, and sometimes we, we push it a little too hard. And, and that's kind of how I feel the Hadoop table operations has kind of, kind of ended up. It's, it's, it's just asking a little too much from something that's not meant to do like concurrent multi entity transactions. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's basically where we're at. So we're 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 all we're all there on on mostly Hive compatible things using thrift uh, using thrift right now, uh, but we're hoping to to move towards a REST future as well. I'm glad you brought up the Hadoop catalog. Uh, it's a great time to discourage people from using that. Um, it's I, I often refer to it as like the the no catalog catalog, and it's really appealing for a lot of reasons, but uh, it also will cause you heartburn later on. So um, thanks for sharing that. And I, I guess, you know, now the next question is kind of diving into what a lot of people have already mentioned or brought up is kind of this transition towards REST catalog. Um, if you have migrated to REST catalog or if you have users using it, you know, what was that experience like? What was the experience for you or your teams or platform or customers? And as you're going down that path, if you've built one yourself, or if you're looking into, you know, different options, like any advice you would give to people who are starting down the same path, Jack? Uh, I guess for me, I had the opportunity to work with an internal team in Amazon to, and, and they, they had the need to try out the REST catalog integration because they, they have a very specific need that cannot be satisfied by Google. And, uh, uh, during that experience, what what went well was that it actually worked out of the box after you did integration. Like most of the engine integrations just worked, which is an amazing sign showing that 
we had a very good build quality for integrations in iceberg community. Different engine maintainers are doing a great job in um, integrating with the REST catalog. Um, and uh, for, uh, however, it, the, the experience for building that kind of service uh, does not work out of the box. It re requires some more investigations into what exactly the spec, what are the details. Um, just take example, I remember that, for example, the schema defining the open API, it's the types are recursive, for example, which means that you cannot, at least for our internal uh, framework, it cannot auto generate a client to be used just because of that. And uh, we had to find different workarounds and there are different different gotchas to handle errors, things like that. So, so it takes a pretty decent life cycle to, to actually develop the REST service to be integrated with all the different engines. But once you get that going, then things will start to be moving much faster and uh, you can start to innovate with whatever business requirement you have inside the catalog service and uh, start to onboard customers, both the, the, like the data supplier and also the data consumer at the same time without having to wait on each other, which is kind of amazing. Yeah, that's a, that's a great call out. I think that a number of projects have noticed that code generated off the open API spec is, you know, sometimes usable, sometimes not. I think the Python project had some good, you know, uh, good code produced that they they then, you know, took and started to massage a little bit, but uh, it's going to be probably difficult to just work directly off of the spec with generated code. Thanks, Jack. Edward? I, yeah, I just wanted to add to, to the rest spec. Yeah, I mean, we've had some challenges with like, you know, directly generating code out of it. But it, it's it's a known issue, and like different languages handle this uh, differently. Um, but coming back to your original question about you know what would I advise for for people you know using Iceberg, so I would definitely advise to you know when you get started with Iceberg, you know go and use the REST catalog because it makes as a you know as a consuming client it makes your life so much easier. Simply you know starting from the fact of the the amount of dependencies you need to to have uh, and then going further to you know like we mentioned earlier there are simply certain features and functionality that are that don't exist in other catalogs and you you will only realize once you you know scale scale up and run things you know run things concurrently like compaction and, and like a lot of um concurrent actions on on tables concurrent updates um you will realize over time that certain things are just handled handled for you when using the REST catalog. It just makes certain pain points go away without you even noticing it. And I forgot what the other question was, actually. Sorry. It was mostly just like, what was the experience so far and any advice? So. Yeah, I mean, the, like I said, the experience so far is that we have very, very positive experience with um, running customers using the REST catalog. Yeah, I mean, okay. I don't know, like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Anjali. We are pretty early in our REST catalog journey. We uh, built out, we implemented spec, uh, built out some simpler, simple operations, did not implement the spec fully, so that needs to happen. But we were eager to get started on integrating Python Iceberg library. And that's not yet in production. We are waiting for partition rights to Python Iceberg. But once that happens, that goes in production. And then we have plans to uh, use a REST catalog for the rest of the data paths, not, not just Python Iceberg. Only one advice, start with REST catalog if you're going to use Iceberg. <laughs> well, so you're, you're in a particular situation, which I think a lot of people would probably, uh, like it would resonate with them, where they have both like Hive catalog and REST catalog. How are you kind of dealing with those coexisting during your transition? I know you're very early on that, but what are your thoughts on kind of like making that all work? Yeah, uh, maybe I can share a little bit about how, where we want to take this next. We want to use REST catalog primarily and nothing else, really. What that means is we are taking out all the business data, user defined data from Polaris, from our meta store into a separate system, Netflix data catalog, which means Polaris becomes just Iceberg metadata. And we wanted to talk REST, uh, Iceberg REST spec. The next step would be we want our engines like Spark and Trino to start 
uh, talking IRC, connect to connect to Polaris, which in turn connects to Cockroach. Python iceberg story is already straightened out. And that looks like a much better world for us, much uh, more seamless world that we can live in. Right now, we are in this in-between limbo state. It's not a very nice state. And just to clarify for everybody, IRC means Iceberg REST Catalog, not the other That's thing right. that some of us remember. Uh, Russell, <laughs> you want to go next? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I can talk too much about um, some of the, the systems that we're working on, but I think people will be able to see um, we've probably stepped up our contributions in a lot of the clients, specifically because one of the things we've been looking at is how do we get our auth scheme to work correctly with all these other clients? Because you know what works for tabular works for aws is maybe not compatible with what we're trying to do so we're just going in there and we're trying to make all those combinations there's a lot of excellent folks uh on my team and at apple who are, are really interested in making this happen so um we're we're early in that phase because we're we're still trying to figure out how we basically use our same off model um with rest uh interfaces and a lot of the spots are there for the integration um, but some of those those are, are basically just holes right now. Um, like one issue we're, we're looking into right now is uh, in the Trino project, uh, currently we want to make sure that we propagate user credentials properly, but the way that Trino currently does that is it just uses the credentials of the, the service and we need it to switch on every single query rather than just passing like a user token to show that it's the user. So that's the kind of stuff we're, all, we're looking into and, and trying to make sure we all have right before we do our full big push at the moment, you know, we're, we're, we're doing lots of testing and, and beta. And of course there's other areas at Apple that already have their own um, implementations because they use different security models. So we're, we're a lot of different things at once. Yep. So that's well known. I think uh, we all have different auth models here across everybody on the panel. So I think it's understandable that there's a complicated area of working with catalogs is how do you integrate your security? Um, so let's see, let's go to the next question, which is kind of, well, what are your next steps? What is your future plans? Uh, let's go with Jack. I guess this is an interesting question for me because for the other people, you guys are rest, 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 but I'm kind of glue and rest. <laughs> uh, it's kind of interesting to, uh, to see what exactly are we gonna do in the future? Uh, but unfortunately, I'm working on the engine side, so I cannot speak for the glue team. Um, at least for now, uh, for us, Glue is still the first catalog we always use to offer new features. Uh, for example, for, uh, like, like in the morning, I think my colleague Yan Yan, she presented the latest fingering access control feature in Spark, which is integrated with Glue, but not REST. Uh, so that will continue to be the trend, uh, at least for now. Uh, however, as you uh, as, as, as in what we see, Apple, Netflix, all these companies are moving towards REST. We do have that on the top priority list, and uh, we are making sure that things on the REST side are covered by all the engines. If that is, if some feature is not there, we are definitely working on making that there in the upcoming years. Um, and uh, personally speaking, I really want those two paths to converge. Uh, that will make my life as engine maintainer much easier to optimize things uh, because there's going to be only a single code pass. But uh, I think we will have to see what new team come up with because I think they are still exploring different ways, like what is the best way to uh, combine both worlds uh, and uh, have things uh, like, like get the merit of both the existing group features and also uh, better support the REST catalog users, which is an increasing number of customers. That's great. I'm excited for that too. Edward. Yeah. So I would say personally, and you know, this is like a long-term thing, but you know, we've been wanting to do like multi-table transactions, a thing for quite a while now. And you know, some building blocks are already in the rest catalog spec, right? What the, the missing pieces are the API pieces, like how does it all, how, how does all of this fit together? Um, how is this being, you know, how do we validate things and how do we integrate this into engine? But like I said, the the building pieces, there's already multi-table commit endpoint in the REST catalog spec, which also means, you know, adopting REST catalog means you get newer features much earlier because REST catalog is, uh, you know, more or less where new, new developments will happen going forward. 
and um, yeah, so I'm so I'm very excited about this. I'm I'm also very excited about you know just helping out other people that are you know investing more into the REST catalog and adding new features and and improving stuff in general, so that we get just wider wider adoption. Okay, Anjali, I know you've touched on it a little bit, but do you want to expand a little on your future plans? Yeah, uh, I talked about modernizing our current architecture a little bit, uh, but what I look forward to is opening up new business use cases with the Iceberg REST catalog. What this allows us to do is to bring in any engine that talks REST, Iceberg REST catalog, and we can try it out, evaluate engines. We keep the data in our warehouse. We keep the metadata. Uh, it solves a lot of issues for us, right? With respect to security, with respect to auditing, governance, all of that. Um, that's a very good place to be in because, as you know, we have storage compute decoupling and we constantly evaluate new engines to bridge the gaps between what we currently have or to make sure that we are using best of the breed. And Iceberg Risk Catalog allows us to do that. So. Uh, my personal hope and wish would be to see more or, more and more engines adopt this um, REST catalog so that I think everybody benefits. That's great. Russell? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess the, the, the nerd in me is very excited about a lot of the technical possibilities here. So I, some of you may remember a really long time ago, I put a proposal for distributed planning in Iceberg, like a really long time ago. And when we were benchmarking that, we found that the delay caused just by shipping all of the metadata back to the driver, and this is in Spark, back to the driver and then back out again, far outweighed any benefit you got from actually doing the planning remotely. And um, I believe, Jack, this is your team has put forth the proposal now for doing planning within the REST catalog, which is the perfect way to do this instead, because then we can basically have all of our planning distributed out from this REST catalog directly to executors rather than having things go back to the driver. So that kind of technical thing makes me super excited because things that I dreamed of doing right when I, I started joining this project and turned out to be pointless, um, now might actually be really awesome and be able to do some cool things. I'm super excited also about um, being able to push more metadata into the catalog itself and being able to query it directly from there. Because that's, I feel like this is my my number one request I get from users is I want to query my table's metadata without actually touching disk, without having security credentials. Like I don't want to give my user access to storage, but I want to give them access to this metadata layer. And currently, I have no easy way of doing that. Uh, you know, so this provides ways of one, putting the metadata there, two, making planning happen in a distributed way in this other layer, and I get to stop touching the disk so often. So, like, these are all really exciting things for me. Um, and I think, in general, I, I've talked about this before. The most exciting thing for me is that I will never have to bug anyone for upgrading clients again because I can just disable people if they're using clients I don't like uh, very easily. And I can always make sure that everything's correct at this central location, um, which is is really different. Um, I think everyone's kind of aware right now that even with all these locking mechanisms, if you're using traditional catalog implementations, including things like Hadoop catalog, where it's super dangerous, people can just put new metadata into your meta store and change your table state. Like we actually have this as a built-in function like register table, which lets you just put a file directly in. REST catalog can support this API as well. But, but basically that lets you make a non-serializable change to the table, anyone who has access to that catalog. So if you give someone right permission on your Hive Metastore, for example, and they decide they're gonna change that table property, they have just broken the serialization of your table, however they felt like it. So it basically gives us a lot more security in protecting the data, protecting the privacy of the of the users that we're storing data for. And I'm really excited about basically having that protective layer as well. Yeah, the uh, I mean, obviously, the catalog is a pretty critical piece of infrastructure and growingly so. And, uh, you know, there there is a lot to say about the difference between the, the various catalog implementations and what kind of models they use. And most of them use the just like repoint a location model. And, and that is pretty coarse grain. 
Um, so I, I think that a lot of the artifacts of what you're talking about is reflective of just how those other catalogs operate. Um, and sometimes, you know, using things like Hive that were never really intended to do this, um, but good for migration and convenience. Oh yeah, it's it's true. It's it's been great for early adoption, getting things working. But uh, we're we're using Hive basically do, to do check and sets, distributed check and sets, which okay. is not the original intent of the project. So. Okay, uh, so I've got the last question here, which is kind of uh, again in line with the the REST catalog conversation. But you know, what would you like to see introduced into the REST spec? Or you know, there are a number of proposals that are kind of out there. So if you want to highlight some of those, as we've done a couple, but you know, beyond that, or thinking beyond where the current state of even the proposals are, what would you like to see in the REST spec? What do you think would help you or the community, Jack? Uh, yeah, I guess Russ already helped me highlight the, the planning proposal. Um, so basically last year, I, I spent a few months um, essentially working with the internal Amazon team. And uh, we did some, as a research purpose, we did the REST catalog prototype. And uh, uh, out of that, there were a few proposals that were born from small things like pagination to uh, relatively big features like the, the pre-planned plan API and uh, some thoughts we have about how can we do faster plans, those kind of things. So those are already in-flight proposals that we have put out in the community that we will keep driving and keep discussing with people to come to a, come to a conclusion and have that fully merged in the iceberg code base. Um, there are also other features like, for example, I think we, we also recently published a proposal for the permission decision framework because if everyone is truly migrated to REST, that means we are standardized on the catalog layer. That means we can even standardize on the permission control layer and that will allow people to freely share data with each other. Um, so, so there's also exciting development we want to help drive in the community around that, especially with our very strong focus on security and access control, as you can see what we are doing in Spark. Um, um, since uh, so we, we want to essentially invest more in those domains. Um, personally speaking, I want to see uh, more development in different database constructs. I really see Iceberg as our an, another take to build a fully open and distributed database. So whatever the database constructs that are missing, I would like to see if we want to add that in the catalog later. For example, we, we had discussions with, about MVs and I think we haven't had a discussion about indexes, uh, many things like that. I think we have a lot of time opportunities in the future to discuss those things. Okay, Edward. Well, I mean, Jack pretty much, you know, <laughs> took everything <laughs> that I would have mentioned. <laughs> but yeah, I'm I'm very excited about the you know appending files and the the server side scan planning, and also the you know the more you know like the the fine grain access control, and you know proposals like these come. Because you know, people and companies invest into REST catalog and, and you know want to widen the adoption, and that, that's a very very good thing for the community and the project. So I'm very excited about those. Um, personally speaking, well, yeah, I mean we should you know invest in um, adding REST catalog to to other engines, make it easier for people to get started. Think less about catalogs and just you know how to make it the lives of people easier, right? That's great. Anjali? I have a couple things. Um, REST catalog allows you to deconflict schema changes and data upend, right, in some cases. That's a very powerful functionality, allows you to get better concurrency. And I'm not sure what, if, I'm, if what I'm saying makes sense technically, but if we could do that on you know, take that one step further and be able to deconflict writes as well. Because for example, you're doing a backfill, you're writing to multiple partitions of data and one write is going against today's partition, another write is going against yesterday's partition. Those are two, obviously two different partitions. If we can deconflict those types of operations, it really unlocks uh, the concurrency. So that's one. Other is multi-table transactions. This comes up in various contexts, and I'm not quite sure if this is actually absolutely needed because we always end up finding other solutions 
but it still feels like it's an important problem to solve because the solutions are always like one off and suitable for just that scenario and then the next thing comes up and we have to think of another solution so multi table transactions would be a pretty powerful feature to have Russell yeah, I mean, uh, Anjali definitely re reminded me of how much I, I want to do that finer grained validation control right now. That's another thing right now that uh, made a lot of sense to put in the client at the time, but now it comes back and we're like, oh, we're, we're actually not not doing so well there because we can't we can't make those fine grained decisions. And I mean, the part that breaks my heart too is the only way to like rebuild your metadata and do those validation checks is break out of your lock cycle. Um, sorry, I'm getting very technical here, but basically it's almost impossible to do that in the current code base. Like we can't do it at the client level without like ripping apart how we currently build uh, snapshots and we do locking. Um, so I'm really excited again. So the REST catalog provides another great avenue for us to start rebuilding that kind of technology. and and doing things um, a little bit differently. Um, not to say that what we have right now isn't also pretty great. I'm very happy with what we have. Just, uh, you, I see that we're just a little bit closer to doing things even better. And that's always very exciting. Yeah, I, I would actually piggyback on that and just say that like the, you know, up leveling some of the checks uh, allows us to in the future incorporate, hey, what are the transactional isolation requirements that need to be enforced in order to do some of these, you know, optimistic operations, do them in parallel, deconflict things. And it, it definitely gets more complicated, but you're right. Like if we rely on clients to have all of that logic, uh, it's unlikely that they're all going to adhere to it properly. And so I, I think there's a lot that can be done and there's yeah. a lot of potential in the, the commit path. Actually. Yeah, I mean, you notice it goes back to the exact same thing I was saying at the beginning is that if your clients are in charge of deciding what's a valid commit, then your clients can do whatever they want and if you have a broken client, as long as that client is out there, you have a threat to your serializability. So that's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but also still a huge advancement from where oh, we've been, which is still, still great. Yeah. Yeah. That's at least that's you know a solvable problem. Yeah. Okay, so that was the the set of questions that we had for the panel today. We do have a few questions that have come in, and I'm gonna try and get to a couple of them before we end for the day. Uh, so the first one was uh, to Edward, I guess, uh, it made a comment, you know, people aren't using or choosing catalogs well. How is this different than a traditional database that most users understand? Um, so maybe, you know, kind of contrasting, you know, single isolated databases with the challenges of a catalog that we're trying to build today. Oh, was that question directed to me? Sorry. Well, to you or anybody on the panel. They they specifically called you out, Edward. So we're gonna start with you on this one. Okay. And then we can hop around a um. Bit. Well, I think you know it's less about like people not using catalogs. Well, it's it's more about first of all, you know, how to choose the right catalog, and then second of all, like understanding what the purpose of the catalog is, namely, you know, keeping a reference to the latest. Meta, you know, metadata for for a certain table, and also providing functionality to, you know, how do you you know address like how do you load the table? Give me whatever, whatever you currently have. And the first point of contact is always the catalog. Like, sure, you could technically somehow implement this using database, right? But there are a lot of challenges in in uh, providing you know certain semantics and certain guarantees. And that's uh, you know what what the catalog is is doing, and also when you when you write new data and update stuff, like this is something that the catalog take, takes care for you. Like it makes sure that the latest uh, new metadata is written, updated, and atomically swapped, uh, so that the catalog points to the new version. I hope that yeah. answers some of that question. <laughs> Anybody else want to add on to that? Jump in and talk about the differences between kind of like a traditional relational database catalog and what a distributed like engine catalog really needs to look like. I think one, one of the things I think about most when I think about this in conjunction here is just that we have a total disjunction here between your table 
and this catalog representation. And that's one of the most exciting things about this is that you can take your representation of the table from any REST catalog and put it in another one because we have a specification. I mean, Ryan talked about it a ton this morning and it, it really, you should you should check out the spec if you haven't. It's, it's really easy to read. It's got a lot of fun details. You can really learn how Iceberg works just from going to that one doc. But it, it basically says, Every REST catalog needs to be able to produce this set of metadata, which represents this table. And if every REST catalog follows that same spec, which they should, you should be able to take that and just put that in a different one. So if, if even if you went with like a commercial vendor, you should be able to move that without ever moving your, your data. Your data can stay in the exact same place. If you were using a commercial catalog, you could switch to a different one. And at the same time, your data can go in any engine because any engine can talk to any REST catalog. So you just end up giving a lot of freedom to people. Where in a relational world, everything is, is kind of tied together. Your catalog is intrinsically a part of how your data is stored. And, uh, you can say for like a data warehouse. Maybe I can I can add a bit of perspective. Uh, being in the industry for about 24 years, started with IBM's DB2 and familiar with systems like Oracle, you know, these closed source enterprise systems where, and in the relational databases, catalog is a system component. It's part of the database. Typically the, the APIs to update any of the metadata are not available to the end user. So it's the system, the database system that's responsible for some of these lower level operations and you get them right and, you know, things work well. In today's modern distributed databases, we make these catalog APIs open and available, which is a huge, powerful thing to do. We have users uh, using Iceberg library and catalog APIs directly. They land the data in warehouse, parquet files, and then they manipulate the metadata and add it to the table. So that is great, but but the uh, a bit of downside there is that if your power user is not such a power user, you have opened up your a catalog, your metadata, your sensitive tables to anybody who can manipulate and potentially do not so great things. And that will affect your warehouse. So I think kind of going back to what Russell brought up a couple of times is like, it does expose you. So uh, it's freedom and responsibility, I guess it, it goes hand in hand here. And, and Jack, I guess, you know, from AWS's perspective, you have some traditional, like Redshift was traditionally kind of a vertical and they've expanded into more kind of distributed processing. How do you think about that versus, you know, uh, the like the multi-engine future versus kind of the vertical future? Yeah, sure. Um, especially since you brought up Redshift, uh, as we can see how, what are the latest features that Redshift is offering? Um, it used to be a full SQL based um, um, data warehouse engine. And then um, now it is also having very strong integrations with uh, catalogs like Blue that or whatever governance feature, um, we are trying to bring that there. And it's interesting, the question was trying to compare the catalog with the traditional DBMS. And uh, as I said in the last question, I think we are in the process of building a much more scalable database that can satisfy a traditional database need. And also we should learn from what is there in traditional database, for example, very strong governance features. And we should find a good way, an open way to bring that into catalog. And uh, that is the direction we should take. I think that actually ties together well with what Russell and Anjali have already said and kind of paints the picture of like, we're at this inflection point where we've got the kind of the distributed thing figured out. Uh, you know, the spec about how to share tables is going very well, but maybe the security is now kind of the next piece that we're figuring out. How do you do that across everything? And then, of course, like transactional stuff beyond that. So very interesting space. I think we're going to go ahead and end the panel questions there. Thank you very much.